Okay, welcome back everyone. For those of you that have just recently joined us, I'm Michael Sowers from the Nebraska Library Commission and with me today are Krista Burns and Laura Johnson, also the Nebraska Library Commission and we are uh, kind of our hosting a big talk from small libraries. We've had three very wonderful sessions already and we're about to have our fourth one. Uh, with us now we have Lindy, Lindsay Hansen, the city librarian, and Linda Holmberg, the school librarian of the combined Centerville Community Library, and they're going to be talking to us about having these joint school public libraries. And so, Lindsay and Linda, you are on the line? Yep, we're here. All right. Uh, just kind of lean into your mic a little bit, and you're all set to go. Okay, thanks. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Combined School City Libraries. You should be seeing some stars coming up on your screen. Go. Today we're going to talk about the benefits of having a city school library under one roof and how to make it work for your community. We're really excited to be here and share some things that we do here in Centerville, South Dakota. I am the city librarian in Centerville. My name is Lindsay Hansen. And I'm Linda Holmberg, the school librarian. How it all evolved. How did it get started? First, let me tell you a little bit about our library and how our community library came to be. The population of Centerville is approximately 900 people. The enrollment in our school as of today is 217. About 20 years ago, a city meeting was being held to discuss some of the town's strengths and weaknesses. It was brought up at that time that the public library was in need of some improvement and that the library should be moved to a different building. Not necessarily build a new building, just a different building, a building with more room for the public library. Around the same time, the school had a state review and the school library was recognized as being inadequate, even jeopardizing if the school would be accredited. The public library was in a room at City Hall, and the school library was nothing more than a small card catalog with a few shelves of books. The elementary classes had a small shelf of books also in each of their classrooms. There was no central located library. The picture you see on the screen on the upper left-hand corner is a picture of the uh, public library, just a small room down at City Hall. And on the lower right-hand corner is a picture of the school library, just a card catalog, a circulation desk, and a few books. This is very similar to how I remember it when I was in school here at Centerville. I heard also later on, because of more classes and stuff, eventually it had been pushed even into a very, very small room, more big, uh, not nearly the size of a closet. So the community wants to do something about this, and they take action. So now the city starts looking into improving the public library. They decide they need a different building. The parents and school board have the results from the state review, and they're concerned and want to do something about their library being rated inadequate. So now we have the city out there, the school out there, both looking to improve their libraries. So someone made the suggestion that the public and the school join resources, and form a library together. The talk is out there. People are talking. The idea is now out there to form a community library. People are now talking. The idea is out there, and they want to form a city school library. Now, we all know how small towns can be, and I know that most of you listening today are um, all from small towns. So once people heard about this idea being brought up about them possibly taking our public library and putting it into the school, you know, at first it just spread like wildfire. And like with most changes um, in a small town especially, it's a change. And people started voicing some of their negative concerns. Some of them were, I don't want to walk through the school to get to the library. Or who's going to pay for all this? Or comments like, it'll be too noisy in there with all those kids. People are really concerned about parking. There's parking issues at the school and at City Hall. Where is everybody going to park? Or the same old comment, what's wrong with our library? It's just fine. 
mostly these people are probably people that weren't even library patrons. But there also was, were those other people talking. Some are excited about the idea and start to think about the possibilities and the opportunities that it might give to our community. What would a combination library, what all the different things that could be for our community? Now the library could possibly have more room to host special programs. Or now there'd be two budgets. We could buy more materials. There will be more space to access materials and resources, computers. There'd be no need to duplicate materials anymore. Why have stuff down in that little room and why have stuff down in that closet? And just think, the library could be open more hours. It could be open during a school day, and then people start possibly thinking maybe we could have some evening hours as well. And wouldn't it be great to bring the adults and the students together? I'd love to see my grandchildren up at the school. People started hoping that they might build on a place for organizations to meet. It was a need in our community. They wanted a place for book clubs to meet, for quilting clubs, for Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. So now that the idea is out there, you need to kind of look at if this idea, is this right for your community? First, you want to look at your service population. I believe, we believe that this combination works well in smaller communities. Um, usually those that just have a small library and one school, probably like in our case, we have a K through 12 school. Um, review your strategic plan. Now, is your library sustainable? Look five, ten years down the road. What does the future of your library look like? Are you going to have the funding? Do you see yourselves being able to hold your own? Now, I do want to stress at this point that if you have a well-established public library with lots of support, maybe this isn't an option for your community. I really want to stress that this is not a let's throw the public library into the school to save some money concept. But if the future of your small town library is questionable, then maybe it is an option worth looking into. Maybe your small school library needs you too. Talk with your current school library, find out their future plans. Are your city librarian and school librarian open to the idea of joining? Do you have a supportive school board, city council that will provide you with the staff and the funding that will be needed? Is there a consensus in the community that a combined library is the best way to meet everybody's needs? What's the general feeling out there? And do you have enough interested to form a committee to do the research? And if you don't have enough people who are out there willing to do the research and take a serious look at this option, it won't go very far. Which leads me to talking about, or Linda, talking about forming a combination library research committee. Yes. There would need to be a research committee. You need to research out all the different options you would have. Let's take a look at who should be involved on this committee. Involvement from both the public librarian and the school librarian, they should be on your committee. You would like to have your school administrators on board and on the committee. The city council members, some of them at least, on the committee school board members would be involved and they should be on the research committee. You would want community members, maybe with or without children. Maybe you would like to get, have a lawyer on your co uh, committee to help with the legal issues or somebody that would be good at writing grants or perhaps maybe a knowledgeable construction engineer if it was going to go that way to build a, a new library. or you just want people with different viewpoints. These are some of the people you would want to reach out to, to be on your research committee. Okay, so now that you've gotten the word out there, that gotten your committee formed together, you get the word out and you start asking the community what they would want. You need to do the research with your committee. 
find other libraries and other communities that are about the same size as yours, visit them. Um, find out and take notes from them what worked and what didn't work. Find out from your state library, they're a great resource, who you should go and talk to. Um, community input. Now at the time when we were joined in 1992, they used surveys, town meetings, and mailers. They did not have the internet, but I believe that the internet would be a awesome resource today. You could build a project website where you could have um, your combo library committee monitor it. People could leave feedback. You could create online polls. This would be a place to post your research, what you have done, the facts, and the plans that you are forming. It's kind of important to have a place that, especially with all the rumors going around with the big change in the community, where people can find accurate information that they can look at. You really want to let the community know about the benefits of the combination school for, that's going to be the benefits for the school, benefits for the public as well. You want to get the word out there and gain their support. Now in the past they did use mailers, they sent out um, surveys, so make sure when you're surveying you want to include people like your library users right now, uh, your school alumni, get them interested since it's, you're joining in with a school, your teachers, your students, um, and I'd also encourage you to reach out to the people who do not use the public library at all and get their feedback as well. Maybe there's something that they would like to see be done differently and they'd like to start using the library again. It's important to get your community to buy into the idea of the community city library. You want to you have your city council and your school board on the same page. Lots of communication between these two boards. Gain their buy-in from receiving financial support from the area businesses, local organizations, personal donations from members of the community, and also mail out letters to that alumni. Make people feel like it is their library. The more you make the community aware of your plans and get their input, the better. It's their library. More community involvement you have, the more likely that it's going to succeed. So now you're finding out what the people want. Now your committee has been working hard, doing the research, getting the support of the community. It's important to listen to what the people want. Now these are some of the things that stood out in our case. They wanted a new building onto the school. They did not want to use like an existing classroom where they would have to walk into the school, try to navigate around all the children to get to the library. So this would mean a separate building built onto the school with a separate public entrance that goes right into the library. They wanted a separate adult section that the children were not in during the day with computers that were assigned just for adult use only. They wanted a meeting room, a place that they could hold meetings for 20th Century Club, the Quilting Club, the Garden Club, the Book Clubs. Um, there was really a need for a place in our community that people could get together. They wanted public restrooms. They didn't want to have to go through the school to use their restrooms, so those went into the building plans as well. And they wanted expanded hours. At the time when they had the library just off the side of City Hall, it was only open limited hours, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, random days a week, 1 through 4 p.m., with a couple hours on Saturday. So the public was really interested in having the hours open during the school day and then maybe having some extended evening hours as well. As well. So these are some of the specifics that went into the, the physical building that we feel contributed to our success. I really think that the separate entrance was really key and we took a lot of what the people wanted and put them into the building plans and again letting the public know that their ideas were being heard. Um, everyone kind of started getting excited at this point that we could you know increase the educational opportunities for everyone not just the school but for everyone in Centerville by creating a better library. Okay so the public voiced their needs. What did the school need? Sure enough, they wanted a new building, and they thought it was a great idea to have it onto the school. They wanted a separate public entrance and an entrance for the school. And 
sure enough, yes, access, uh, handicap access into the library would be great. They weren't so sure they wanted the adults in their library either. So have a separate adult section. A meeting room, yes, they needed a meeting room also. They needed it to teach library skills and uh, different uh, meetings with teachers. Public restrooms for the kids down uh, at the library would be great so they wouldn't be roaming the halls. And the expanded hours, that would be great also. Kids doing research, no computers at home, go back to the library. They're open a couple nights a week, or they hope they would be uh, now. But specifics that the school needed, they wanted this library to be centrally located library. Not centrally located in the school, they just wanted all the books in one place, a place where the kids could go to the library. They wanted more recreational and resource reference books. Their library was now in a closet and a shelf in their classrooms. They needed a library. They wanted library skills to be offered. Learn how books are arranged, all about the different genres of books, how to look up a book, how to look for a book, look up a book on a computer, how to use the computers, etc. They wanted exposure for their kids to have a library, into the library atmosphere. Some had never even been in a library before. It was just a small room down in City Hall. Why bother go there? They wanted the library atmosphere just to learn about the library manners. How, how do kids act in a library? They wanted a library where their students could prepare for college. College information would be available, all about the different colleges and Votex. Also, ACT testing prep uh, books, uh, workshops, GEDs, etc. They would like it to access to access to technology, a catalog online, preferably web-based, similar to what they would be finding in a library college at a library in a college. Also, if we couldn't have all the books, there would be interlibrary loan available for them. So the big question on everybody's mind is where would the money come from? So some of our original startup costs for the model they used here in Centerville, uh, the city council applied for some federal grants. Um, and your state library can help direct you in the right direction to find the correct grants if you're interested in doing something like this. Um, the school used capital outlay certificates at the time. Then we also had memorials and donations um, come in from our community. And that, again, also helps the people feel like this was their library, more of the buy-in, like Linda was saying earlier. Um, we here had plaques made for all the area businesses that donated, and they also had plaques made for all of the personal donations that were made to the library. And these plaques are hung as you walk right into the doors of the library. Um, our town slogan is also there where it says Centerville, where you make the difference. So even just giving that community feel and the people that help support it right as you walk in the door. So now that you have thought about the funding for the original startup, you do need to start thinking about budgeting and the future and where this and how this will work out the details. So you need to do that in a written contract. This is key. You need your school board and your city council to work out budget details in a written contract. A written contract? Is it really a need to have a written contract? People ask us all the time, do we have a written contract? Of course we do, we say. They laid out the groundwork with a lawyer, created a legal document that both parties signed. These are some of the important things that they put in the original contract that we feel make us successful. Specifics about the meeting room, purchasing books, ownership of the books, would the school librarian work in the summer hours, who was responsible for the building upkeeps, utilities, janitorial duties, things like this. What would happen if the library would dissolve? If at some time it needed to uh, separate their uh, materials. 
how the library would run money budgets. Our contract was made in 1992. So keep in mind that things may come up after the contract is made that need to be worked out. An example for us would be that in the early 90s when our contract was written, Wi-Fi was not something that we put into our contract. You deal with the issues that come up later with lots of communication, cooperation, and just plain old common sense. Your library board helps with creating the policies, and these are written up uh, needed to have a library board. We feel some may fail because no contract or specifics is in place. We also feel in our situation, at least in our library, that two librarians are very important. Some, some libraries only have one in one library, and that's their preference. We feel that this would be difficult to provide an excellent service to both public and school patrons. The amount of work in a K-12 uh, setting especially need extra help for the extra hours from the expanded hours of uh, keeping the library open longer. And you know we've heard of a lot of libraries that have failed after they've combined because they didn't have the written contract. Um, they may have started out with two librarians in the beginning but one may have retired and then they're not replaced because it's not in a written contract. So then they're just left to having to cut down their hours again and one librarian's there to fend for the school and for the public. So it's really not fair. So it's really key to get that written contract. Okay, so as we stated in the written contract, a library board. Now your library board should be a board that is not the city council and that is not the school board. It should be a separate board. So who should you have on this board? You would need representatives from city council, representatives from your school board, representatives from your community. The school and city librarian should also be present for the, school, for the library board meetings. At our library, the city council assigns a member to the library board and they take turns and rotate members. The same thing with the school board. They assign someone to be on the library board for a year and they rotate members. Um, community members also rotate turns as well. We try and seek out those people, like Linda was saying earlier, that are library supporters who are particularly good at writing grants. Um, we're fortunate enough to get a lawyer that's in town that likes to take turns on the library board. So try and seek out those people that you think would really help push you guys in the right direction. How we make it work. How we make it work to have a city, school, library in one building under the same roof. With a lot of cooperation and a lot of commitment. We have a one, we have a community, one approach program not two separate programs that are sharing the same building. We created an environment that young children, teenagers, young adults, and older adults feel comfortable in. We understand our roles as both the school library and the public library. We share the role of library director. There's no mine versus yours mentality. We have the support of our library patrons, support of our city council, and support of our school board. And financial support comes from city council and the school board and our library patron patrons as well through donations. So as Linda said earlier, a lot of things boil down to common sense. You need to keep the lines of communication open once you do merge. Um, it is easier to keep the communication open with the school because you're connected to it. But for city council, you'd encourage them to be continually visiting your library, but also I would encourage you to write up a report at the end of each month that they, you tell what's going on in your library, the things that you've got going on that you're proud of. Keep them thinking about your library and in, your, and in their minds. So give that report to the city council so they can hand it out at their monthly meetings. Our community library. This is a picture of our community library. It's the east entrance into it. 
And you can see uh, out front, there's nobody parked, but that parking's intentional to leave it open for the public. Uh, a sign on both uh, sides says library parking. Here's a picture of the cars that are out there, are probably teachers, workers at the school, but there's always supposed to be left parking for the public. Here's, as we mentioned, they wanted and they got a separate adult section. This is our adult section. In front here would be a, a row of bookshelves, and on that bookshelf are um, large print books. Also, we have a separate section we were lucky enough to get. It's uh, for the little, littler kids, uh, and it's off by itself, and this is great in our library in a K-12 and public. You know, uh, gets to be pretty active in there. Here's another picture from outside. You can see the uh, Centerville School sign, and this is the school, and back is the library, and it's just connected, and back in here would be the parking. And also, behind this tree, we have a nice little garden area and a table and chairs with an umbrella, so in the nicer months, kids go out there and sit and read and stuff. Here's the entrance between the school and the uh, library. Here would be the door, if you can see my mouse. And uh, also, we uh, in later years, uh, I, there's some storage area that um, we got, we have uh, put in, and we also have our DVDs. Uh, and videos and things like that out here, and right, and that's where we usually have our book sales. Uh, we have just a small little teen area. It's uh, not close up by the desk. It's back by a window, a uh, good sunny place. We have a couch and a couple chairs for the kids, and we also have uh, high school magazines back there. And this is a picture of right beside the uh, little kids' room, and this is our uh, Christian fiction area. And this used to be our little kids' area, but we did get to expand. We have expanded since then, and through that window, and then there's a doorway here into our little kids' area. So just to review a little bit, you'd be thinking, is a combo library needed in your town for the sustainability of your library? Um, what does the future hold for your library? Are people interested in being able to double up on resources, have more hours, more programs, more technology offered? Um, remember that a community library will allow you to be open more, more hours and is often the first place that people who are new to your town or thinking about moving to your town see. So our library has been seen as a weakness in our school and in our community in the past. And they've changed that around, and now it's seen as one of our biggest strengths of our community. We have people that come in here and they can't believe um, what a nice library we have for the size of our town. And we believe we wouldn't have that unless we had joined together. We feel that we have created a, uh, in Centerville a community library for the young, the old, and everyone in between. On these pages, we want to just give you some ideas on how we continue to keep the public and school involved in our library. Anytime the library offers a, reading, offers a reading incentive program to the students, the public is invited to join in as well. We invite the public to participate in all special events and programs. Make it a community event. We post um, all of the events that we have going on in the library in the Centerville Journal, which is our town's weekly newspaper. We have a library news column where we keep the community up to date about what's going on at the library. The summer reading program that is funded by the city during the summer gets donations from the local arts council, which allows us to bring in more special programs. We get prizes donated from library supporters and local businesses. This keeps kids and parents in the library throughout the summer. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about, uh, just briefly, about what some of these pictures are. Up at the top left, uh, one year, a library incentive, we had a wall of readers. And we took uh, pictures of students reading their favorite book. 
then the, it was a it was a gift they could uh, we also made a little package they could uh, take it home as a gift to their parents grandparents whoever this is a, another uh, Centerville Smarties, uh, dependent on how many books they've read, this great big huge uh, uh, plastic bag, Centerville Smarties, and then we, uh, for, for as many books they read, they filled it with little Smarties we made out of toilet paper rolls, uh, and it was where the, the kids really liked it. And the community got involved in that as well. They liked coming in and mm -hmm. filling out papers to start filling up our giant Centerville Smartie bag. Took a long time. <laughs> Uh, here's a picture of the Zoomobile up at uh, during summer reading. This was actually just a project we did something different last uh, year for National Library Week. Instead of uh, bringing in presenters, we did special uh, something special every night after school in the library for adults or uh, just the students. And we did have a special um, presenter in, and that was a student, an artist. Uh, also, but that was the kids had a lot of fun with that. Here, somebody donated a, a, from a Bible school a building, and uh, for a couple of years we had it in the library, and we would change it out with a Wizard of Oz theme. We had a gingerbread theme, um, the Three Bears theme. Um, and we had it quite a while, and the kids really enjoyed it. Down here is uh, Sylvester Monk. McMonkey McBean's um, Sneech, machine. Sneech machine. Yes, we're we're in the process of rebuilding this uh, right now. The uh, fifth graders put on a play for the rest of the kids, and uh, usually done during Dr. Seuss Week's birthday. Yep. And here's like the tattoo group or uh, something like that came down, and you know I. Uh, ask the teachers if they're going to present to anybody, let's do it in the library, let's get everybody involved. And here, this was just uh, for uh, Easter parade and kids made Easter hats. And that's that's about it. Just some of the things that we do, just fun things. So we really try to remain visible in our community, um, being a community library. So some of the things that we do, as Linda's pulling up some of the pictures here, um, we have a float every year in our homecoming parade and our Christmas parade of lights, just to remind people that we're out there. We have artwork that the students work on in the art classes on display at the library. It's a great way for the students to show off their work to the parents, grandparents, parents, and the general public, and it gets more people into the library. On the public side, we also have displays from local artists. We mention these displays in our local news. So whenever there's a new local artist, there's just a picture of Linda and I that popped up. That's us this year. Our float got a little bit ahead of us and got a little tangled in our lights. We were handing out gingerbread cookies, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, we do concession fundraisers at our school sporting events. Um, being connected to the school, we're able to sign up to do concessions for the sporting events, which is awesome. Um, usually we do about two of these a year. All the prop proceeds from the concessions go into a special account where we buy things like reusable library bags, magnets, with pens, everything with our name on them that we can hand out to the public. And people just love getting things, especially when they come and they're new to our town, kind of a little welcoming packet. We have an annual Christmas open house each year. Coffee and cookies throughout the day, special entertainment in the evening, and a silent auction that also runs up runs throughout the day. We encourage everyone to come, especially those who haven't been to the library in a while. All silent auctions are itemed, uh, all silent auction items are donated, so it's pure profit to us. We have a raffle item that is given away. This year, someone was generous and donated a hand-crafted quilt. And there's a picture there. Hope you guys can see it. There we go picture there of the little girl with that and her grandmother ended up putting her name in to win the quilt. And here's a um, every year we have a holiday home tour. This is something that Centerville's done for quite a few years. We have five families that graciously open up their homes to us. Um, they decorate their homes for Christmas and people come to the library. The registration is five dollars. Um, this year we also 
offered a tour bus for an additional two dollars and they can go around and tour the five homes and all those proceeds go to the library as well um, I think there's a picture yet up there of our one of our Santa ornaments every year we create a different ornament but it's always a Santa theme and I think we've been doing this for about 15 16 years and people come and they collect them and they're really excited to see what we're going to come up with every year for a different ornament to sell. And I'll just tell you just quickly about uh, some of these pictures. This was this year's entertainment at our open house. And here's a picture of on the lower right hand of the audience, bringing uh, young and old and everybody in between together. Here we have a pumpkin decorating contest in the fall. And uh, we give out... Uh, a lot of cash prizes, and this is probably from our concession money. There's a little a girl with her quilt. Up here we had an author visit, and this is one of our patrons uh, getting a book signed. And that's in our meeting room. In our meeting room. Yep. And here is a retirement party for uh, a lady that had worked in the school for many years. And here's actually Lindsay and myself and a couple, a uh, board member and her husband that uh, with one of the entertainment, uh, they put us kind of put us on the spot there, I think, in front of everybody. Here's one of our homecoming floats. Uh, it's fun to get out there, and people even look forward to see what we're going to come up with next. All together, we feel everyone wins. We have a shared purpose. We believe that having a combined library has more benefits for our community members and our students. Now, we understand that every town has its unique issues. Be in contact with your state library. They are an excellent resource for you. Um, if you have any questions or comments, um, feel free to ask us now if you can. Um, otherwise, we're available for you to contact us. We don't want to leave you with the impression that we know it all because we don't. But we'd be happy to answer any of your questions and help you in any way that we can. Um, we really hope that you took away some ideas from our presentation today that could be useful in your library. And we really want to thank you for attending. And we'll just open it up for questions. On the next page here, I believe we have our contact information. Um, they did let the city library and me have a school email address as well. so. This is the best way to get in contact with us. All right, great. That was absolutely wonderful. And I do believe we have some questions from the audience for you. Oh, yes. Our oh, of course. Audience we do. Is, uh, first, we have somebody who'd like to know what your mission statement is. You, you have that memorized, uh, right? <laughs> the mission statement. <yeah. laughs> well, our mission statement, just to serve both public and the city, um, kind of at the end there, we say we have a shared purpose, that we believe that having our library together combines more um, benefits for community and the students. Um, I don't know if we have our set one right in front of us we right don't. now. but <laughs> Sorry. We don't have our policy book, and it is in the front page. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, and now we have somebody who's asking, how do you handle it? Uh, mixing movies in a school community library, especially with regard to ratings? Um, that's a very good question. We do not allow students to check out any movies that are PG-13 or rated R. Um, their parents have to sign a waiver even for them to check out any type of movies to begin with, and then they can say whether they want, um, yeah, it's okay for them to have PG-13, it's okay. We don't have as many R-rated movies. We really try to keep in mind, um, you know, who our audience is here. But we do have quite an extensive collection of DVDs, and the community, especially in the last couple of years, have really taken advantage of borrowing from us. So we um, just try to keep keep common sense in the mind there too. But yeah, parents have to sign a waiver in order for students, and they're not allowed to check the DVDs out during school. It's something they have to do after school. Okay. All right. Um, someone's really interested in those Santa ornaments, and they wondered if you have some past ornaments or patterns that you could share. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could maybe, uh, a lot of them we make up, but uh, we could sure take pictures of them. We have pictures of them, and we could uh, put them on as a, 
an attachment or something like that. Yeah, we have quite a collection and quite a lot of people, uh, patrons, that do collect them and have all of them. Okay, well, and we have a couple of people saying thank you. They think it's a great presentation. Um, I, I have a question I'll throw in here, um, kind of along the lines with the, um, the movies. Um, what, if any, issues do you have with um, filtering on your internet connection if you do or don't, and if so, how do you handle that? For our internet connection, that is something we're dealing with right now. Um, when the library, as Linda was saying, was first put together, um, Wi-Fi wasn't an issue, and really internet was still kind of new, so they didn't address that issue. So um, we are now working with, um, we had a technology assessment through our state, and they're going to give us some ideas about how we can have some unfiltered computers for the adults to use, because right now they're filtered through the state. and cause because we are in a school, and in order for the school to receive funding for their internet, they needed to have a certain web filter. So we are working right now on getting the Wi-Fi connections so that adult patrons can come in here and view Facebook and some of the things that they try to keep the kids off of. Yeah, because we do have a lot of things that uh, come up that are blocked because uh, the state supplies the internet here at the school. That's one, one obstacle right now that we're dealing with. We're working on it. So, so just to to kind of make sure I understand you right, when when you when you get the Wi-Fi in, that that will be unfiltered. When we get the Wi-Fi, this is um, all coming back with our technology plan that we hope to get soon from the state. But um, they told us they'd be able to kind of put up a wall. We'd have to give up. We'd have to get our own. Um, filter and for our own two adult computers and then there would be a password for the Wi-Fi. So the students with their laptops, if they happen to pick up on it when they're down in the library, they won't be able to access it without the password. Okay. All right. That sounds good. I just the, the only thought that pops into my head is um, the students will get a hold of that password. <laughs> Yes, so. and yes, and we've thought about that too. We'd have to be changing the password probably daily. Wow. So okay. Anyway, hey. Linda and I would be the only ones that, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. That would hey, know yeah. the password, and so we it out. Yeah, it's it's an issue. Um, do I I always have questions. Do we have any other questions coming in from the audience? Have um, we seen any do have a comment okay. that sometimes you have to keep in mind that you need to err on the side of the children. Um, do you find that true? We can't hear you. Uh, could you repeat it, please? Uh, do you find that um, you you are aiming this more toward a um, K-12 audience than to the general uh, public audience, generally? Our library? Our yeah. whole library? Yes. No. Uh, uh, you know, yes, we are in school, but we try to include the public in, in, in everything we do. And uh, they love to come in and look at the artwork. Uh, we have public you know, artists, artists in the community that like to put on displays. We, um, our open house every year is all gained towards the public. That has nothing to do with really the school. So mm -hmm. the access is very easy for the public to come into the school on the east side of our building. Um, you know, we have lots of uh, community organizations that are in the school all the time uh, signing up to use the meeting room. We actually wish uh, we had another meeting room. Uh, the, the public are not afraid at all to come into our library. Yeah, we have found that since they have, you know, built on and it didn't, they didn't take a part of the school, they actually created something together where it was a school library and a city library made brand new. So it was a new model, not just part of the school. So, yeah, I think a lot more people use the public library than they did before. We actually have the retired librarian here with us now for the questions, and she said absolutely there's more uh, uh, patrons that come into the community library than previously in her small room. Yeah. And you may see more of the pictures from things that we do with the kids because, yeah, we are in a school, but we do try to do things just specifically for adults as well and include them in anything that we do. Mm -hmm. um, we have and they enjoy that. Oh, good. Uh, we have one more. Do the school and the city equally fund the library? 
Y yes, we have separate budgets. Um, so I am, like, the city librarian is paid by the city. The school librarian is paid by the school. Um, she has a separate budget for her books. I have a separate budget for my books. So we do get the benefit of having two different budgets. And, you know, in one of the slides it said uh, won't have to duplicate uh, materials. And we think that it's just a win-win uh, because why would, you know, we didn't have much of a city yeah. library or a, but, you know, a lot, some of the stuff that they did have was duplicated. And how one-to-one -one ratio are those two budgets? Are they pretty even? Um, they're actually, they're pretty even, actually. Um, I, the money that I receive, I try to actually spread out as if I was buying for a public library. So I would have, I buy kids' books, I buy little kids' books, I buy adult books, I buy large print books, audio books. Um, whereas Linda gets more focused on the little kid books and, you know, junior high and high school. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, we have one who's asking, how do you separate operating supplies? Um, that's, we really don't, you know, that goes back to the mine versus hers mentality. We both buy supplies from our supplies budgets, so we kind of have a back room that, um, hey, we both bought scissors, or I buy the scissors, or she buys the scissors, we both use them. You know, I probably buy more of uh, craft stuff during the school room for my story time and stuff, but then Lindsay, you know, has a uh, summer reading program with uh, probably a hundred kids, so um, we both, we both buy and share, so yeah. Great. So, so that, that it for yeah. our audience? All right. Yeah. Well, I, the, the comment I'll add is it sounds like you both work very well together. Um, so either you both well, can we have a lot of fun. Yeah, either you both can never leave or you both have to leave. When, when, you know, <laughs> somebody replaces one of you, I, I hope it, it, it works out as well as it sounds like it is, it is going right now. Yeah, you just got to use a lot of cooperation, common sense, and... No power struggle because we're both co-librarians. None of us are the boss of each other. And if you come in with that attitude, I think just cooperation and working together, just common sense. Great. It works out. All right. Well, thank you very much. That, that was absolutely wonderful. And uh, we're just a few minutes ahead of schedule, which is never a problem. Um, so what we're going to do is um, thank uh, Lindsay and Linda one more time. Uh, we really appreciate all the effort you, you put into your presentation.